Today we present our lecture entitled The Rider on the White Horse, which is the riddle of an age commencing with the birth of Christ 2,000 years ago and terminating with the present crisis of our times. I want to read to you two verses from the book of Revelation that I believe are very much involved with this riddle of our time. Revelation 6, 1 states, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. Revelation 6, 2. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. We are very much involved in this scripture with the purpose of our life. And this purpose does not relate alone to Jesus Christ. It relates to every tiny babe that at any time is born to any mother upon this planetary body. It relates to all. Because all have a similitude of purpose. We do not have one born unto honor and another unto dishonor if we are going to deal with the concept of the Lord God created man in his own image. If this statement be true, that the Lord God created man in his own image, then it must be true not only for Jesus Christ, but for every man. All were created in the image of God. Now when Christ was born 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, it was not just the phenomena of a tiny babe, of a nativity. There have been millions, billions of nativities, of natal days since that time. And no doubt, in the days to come, we will see countless other billions born upon this planetary body. Many, of course, will be here for the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on ad infinitum times. It will not be the first time they've ever been born on the earth. Consequently, we're going to have to count people more than once, whether we like it or not. What we are concerned with then is what was born 2,000 years ago. Was it the Christ consciousness, the consciousness of the Christ that was born in Jesus, or was it just the man born unto Mary? The answer comes clear to us, that it was much more than a man. In order for this to have relevance to us, we should understand that all of us have that native spark of heaven within ourselves. That that native spark of heaven is the only part of us that is real because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Our bodies die, our minds dissipate, because without the chemistry of a body and a soul behind it, of what value is a mind? The mind is valid in these dimensions because it is able to some degree to cope with the problems that we find in our world. But 2,000 years ago, the consciousness of Christ was manifested. It did not then come into being. One of the errors that people make and I sometimes wonder how people can make such a stupid error. They seem to think 
that at the time Jesus was born, that what was emerging for the first time was the consciousness of Jesus. How ridiculous can we be? The consciousness that was emerging at that time was a manifestation of the Christ. In other words, it was unique in Jesus, yes, but it was not unique in the world because it clearly states in the scriptures, before Abraham was, I am. That means that before Abraham, way back in the time of Abraham was, that the consciousness of the Christ, the consciousness of the I am, existed. It didn't begin to be just at the time that Jesus was born. It began to manifest in him, and his life mission came into reality. So we have to understand the emerging Christ consciousness. Now I think it was a pretty unique consciousness. At least his understanding of the Father was very great. For example, here's a woman that comes along and has an issue of blood. And this woman goes to every physician, every physician that existed at that time that she could find. And they were unable to help her. So she walks into the crowd and mingles with the crowd and presses her way up till she finally gets to the master's feet. She reaches out her hand trembling and she touches the hem of his garment. And immediately the issue of blood is dried up and the woman is healed. What took place that caused the master to say, who touched me? For I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. He perceived, not the woman, but he, the Christ perceived that virtue had gone out of him. And where had it gone? Into the woman. And the virtue of the Christ had corrected the condition in the woman that none of the physicians of the time were able to correct. We're talking about the emerging Christ consciousness, a consciousness, an awareness of God, an awareness of something metaphysical, extraterrestrial, outside the physical body. Something was living, was vibrating, was animating this consciousness that was very, very great. Yet, when we find that Jesus had to be picked out of the crowd of rude and ignorant fishermen and tax collectors, etc., that were the disciples of Christ, Iscariot had to be employed for 30 pieces of silver in order to pick him out. Why? Because he did not have a visible physical halo. He did not have a ring around his head. He didn't look any different than the people he was with. Those in this world could not distinguish him. There was no vibratory quality that they could distinguish because the sensory perceptions were not able to distinguish the Christ from any other man. Do you realize that? This ought to prove to your consciousness today that what manifested at that time was the Christ consciousness, the awareness of God. He said, I and my Father are one. So what manifested then that healed the woman, that raised the dead, that walked on the waters, that could disappear from physical sight? Was it just the manifestation of a magician? Was it just the manifestation of a very clever man? I hardly think so. In those days, they did not have the trappings that we have today. There was no scientific achievement that could actually change Uh, the consciousness of the people. There was no hypnotism developed at that time, no mesmer. In other words, what took place at that time was a true and genuine manifestation. It was not something that someone created as an illusion. That was the emerging Christ consciousness. 
And that Christ consciousness was aware of the living God. Rooted in the tradition of the ancient Hebrews, we find comparable to it, to the manifestation of Jesus, the ministry of Elijah, for example. And I think most of you will recall that ministry. Do you remember how the trial was actually held between the prophets of Baal and the prophet Elijah? You remember that? How they poured water all over the offering that Elijah brought to the altar and how Elijah looked up to God and fire came down and licked up even the water. Yet the priests of Baal had stood all day and tried to get an answer from their God without success. Now we find Elijah in his trial by fire immediately manifest the power of the living God. And this was manifest by Jesus the Christ. There is no question about it. It was a living manifestation. But it was not something that was just an illusion. It was real and it brought out the multitudes. Thousands of people came to the hillsides to hear him speak. Okay, let's leave it right there. Most of you know the story. And let's go onward. And let us consider what happened to the anointing of the apostles, the anointing of the church, the traditions and the great mysteries of the great white brotherhood, which were confided by Jesus in secret to his disciples. Let us see what happened to that tradition. It was absorbed by the world. But how was it absorbed by the world? I want to cover this very carefully with you because this is very important that you understand it. Have you ever heard the saying, if you cannot lick them, join them? I want you to understand that in the time of the Emperor Constantine, he was able to recognize quite clearly that the growing Christian sect was eventually going to exceed the gods of Rome. And he was no fool. He realized it was the best part of wisdom to get on the side of the Christian. And so he became one. And we find that more and more throughout the stream of history that there was an absorption by the world of the traditions of Jesus Christ and the worship of Jesus Christ without actually living the principles of Jesus Christ. In other words, what he stood for, what he did, the power he had, he said, you shall receive power after I am gone, you shall be imbued, he said, by the Spirit from on high. How many men today and women do you find that actually have the healing power of Jesus Christ? How many people today can raise the dead? How much of it do you see going on in the world? Not too much, do you? Now, there is a law here that I consider quite important. It is this, that if you absorb a principle without being changed by it, you become like a sponge that soaks up water and then dries out until you once again are a waterless sponge. This is the principle of absorption. The church absorbed the teachings of Jesus and then it dissipated those teachings and from generation to generation lost the power and the contact that the early Christians had and it lost its identity. The church that was perpetuated was actually less and less generation after generation of the first original church. Now when I stood in Rome, on the very spot that Jesus Christ appeared to St. Peter, I took my hand almost in the fashion of Thomas, 
and I put them down into the hollow of the footprints. They're not the real footprints, but they're the simulated ones, the real ones being locked up somewhere else. But I placed them there nevertheless on that spot in proximity to where Jesus appeared. And I want you to know that I could feel the currents of the living God like a flame go right up my arms. Now when a band marches by, playing a stirring march, you might get chills up and down your spine. That's something else. But the flame I felt was not just a nerve reaction. It was a power, and I said a power, and I meant a power. I could feel that current, just like you stuck your fingers into an electric socket. And it showed me very clearly that there was a definite Akashic record preservation of the presence of Jesus Christ on that spot still, which indicates to me the stature of that magnificent master. Now then, what happened through the years? Why the people absorbed it and they lost their identity as followers of God. Then, as time passed, men changed doctrinally. In other words, the doctrines and the teachings that Jesus Christ confided in secret to his disciples were not transmitted, and I'm going to tell you why. It's a very simple and easy thing. People sit down with their minds and they read what Jesus did. Now, then they interpret it. And in the interpretation of what they read is where the error comes in. If a man actually reads and believes and has the correct understanding that the early apostles had, we would have no difference today in our churches. We would have miracles, we would have power, we would have demonstrations, we would have changed lives because the teachings that Jesus transmitted to the apostles were really a power. They talk about the laying on of the hands of the presbyters. They talk about the laying on of hands. When the hands were laid from apostle to teacher and from teacher to teacher, I assure you that there was transmitted the currents of the Holy Spirit whereby the teachings of Jesus were preserved in action in action. It was not just a mental idea. It was an action of the Spirit. Therefore, we should understand that to change the doctrine or to change the action is to fail to pass the torch to the succeeding generation. And this is what has happened in our time. The people today, as a, as a group, as a mass, have not received a transmittal in their churches of the pure teachings of Jesus the Christ. I know this to be true. And as a result of that, the impact is destroyed in the masses of the people. In the scriptures we find that the people are called a sea, the sea of the masses. In the razor's edge, W. Somerset Maugham has one of his characters talk about the one drop of water taken out of the ocean, referencing the soul of the individual, referencing individuality, referencing you and me, all of us. We should understand clearly then that the masses are the sea. And in one sense of the word, you will find the sea has its surface and the sea has its depths and it has its equality. If you look at the sea that's calm, you will notice that it is nothing more than a straight line if you wanted to draw it. You just see, in the words of the ancient mariner, water, water everywhere. And that's the way it is. Now this silent sea is actually representative of the people of the world, the masses. And it is in the sea that the absorption has occurred. The masses of the people 
at one time were pretty much in the process of turning toward Christ. This is not true of the Far East. In the Far East we found that they turned toward Krishna, toward Mohammed, toward Shintoism, toward Buddha. But in the West, where the Christian tradition actually flourished and grew, we find that the people were turning toward the Christ, but they were also absorbing him without actually letting the action of the Christ have the impact it was designed to have in their lives. Now let's take a look at the continuing technological gain of history. We find that men probably used whale oil lamps, for example, for light, or they used tallow and paraffins or coal oil. We find that their transportation from the time of Christ was primarily on horses, on horseback, on boats, and there was no railroad, there existed no automobile, no aeroplane. Then in a short space of time, far less than a hundred years, with the advent of the internal combustion engine, we see a technological development sweeping across the Western world. It did not actually materialize too much in the Orient. We have now a giant technological complex in our world. And this has created in what we now term as Christendom or Christianity, a battle between light and darkness, a battle between good and evil, a battle between materialism and spirit. There is no doubt in my mind that the spirit has always existed. I don't think we have had the type of materialism such as we have now in existence. And I will tell you why. Years ago, when men had to actually cut out their own shoes, when they had to make their own garments, when they had to draw their own water out of wells, when they had to walk miles to get it, when they had to hunt for their own food, grub roots and berries out of the earth, struggle for their existence, so much of their time was taken up by the doing of this that people had little time to be materialistic because they were busy about the ordinary tasks of doing. Now today, when we can go to a grocery store, we can buy a can of tuna fish full of mercury, <laughs> and uh, we can do all these little things, you know, and pop something into the oven, our microwave ovens, and pull it out again in 10 seconds maybe later, and it's all cooked. Well, we don't have too much struggle with uh, the business of living, so we have a little more time on our hands. As a result, man becomes increasingly pleasure-centered because his consciousness is free to roam the possibilities that are known to him, the things that he knows that he can seek. And he doesn't want to seek God, and I'm going to tell you why a bit later. I'll show it to you. So you have a continuing technological gain, and there is a battle between materialism and the things of the Spirit. Now right in the midst of this, from the beginning almost of the Christian church, you have had what I will term an institutionalized build-up. This means that the church has become a worldly business. The church has acquired large areas of land, hospitals, schools, and vast holding. Many of you people do not realize, unless you stop and think about it, the tremendous holdings of the Christian church in the world today. Next to government, they probably own more than any other organization. And so you have had an institutionalized buildup supposedly to serve Jesus Christ and the pure teachings of Jesus Christ, the freedom teachings of Jesus Christ, 
the purposes of life and the ways that a man can find the kingdom of heaven and genuine happiness. Yet, now here's what's happened. We have had a takeover of our churches by whom? By the diabolical forces of darkness in our world. St. Paul referred to it as spiritual wickedness in high places. And we have had this without question. We have had a takeover of the churches. They are not today dispensing the cosmic prescriptions to mankind that will make him whole. It has become formalized, brittle, until it is almost on the verge of breaking up. Now why is this being done? It is being done to create a dryness in the atmosphere from which the populace or the masses or that sea will desert the sinking ship of the church as rats desert a sinking ship. In other words, they want to get off. And you're seeing this take place in the world today at a time when the world needs religion more than it ever needed religion before. It is finding the church has less and less relevant answers to provide to the people and provides them no viable solution whatsoever to their problems. And they see it as brittle. They see it as a mockery. And there are many reasons for that. The world cannot exist half slave and half free was a statement Abraham Lincoln made. And I do not believe that the world today, that in this case I will apply the church, the church now that claims to be the church of Christ cannot exist half slave and half free. And that is exactly what has happened. Because there are no workable solutions there, because they have actually turned themselves in many cases into an anti-Christ organization, the people are leaving the churches and returning to the world, and what really are they getting? And let's see why. Not long ago, one of the largest churches in our land received communicants at her altar wearing the natural clothing of Adam and Eve without any clothing on at all. And there they, they applied for permission to take the Lord's Supper at the altar of this church. In another very well-known church in this country, a very strange thing took place at a men's club meeting. They took a poll of the widows in the church, especially the young widows, and they said they felt it was a Christian duty that the men should take care of the sexual needs of the young widows in the church. Now you ask yourself this question. Not only is this not the, the act of Christ, but it is the act of Satan to even propose such a thing. Because we find in the case of Mary Magdalene, the harlot, that when she stood before Jesus Christ, he gazed upon her not with condemnation, but with vision. He was able to see these things around her all that she had done. And when he saw these things, she could feel that he could see them. And she recognized that he was able to convey his consciousness of the Father to her. And so she listened to him. She called him Rabboni, Master. And she loved him. And he forgave her sin. And she later conveyed to him a precious jar of ointment. Ointment of spikenard. And it was very expensive. And she anointed his feet with it. And she wiped his feet with her own hair. And he said that to those who have much forgiven, there is much love. And so we see that love, genuine spiritual love, 
existed in this relationship between Mary Magdalene and Jesus Christ. Humanity today need forgiveness, but they need direction, they crave direction. They need awareness, they crave awareness. They need guidance, they crave guidance, yet they do not want to be fooled because no man enjoys or no woman enjoys being fooled. They want the truth and only the truth can make man free. Now, as a result of this institutionalized buildup of which I spoke in the church, the takeover of the church, we find that the church is now committed to a social and in some cases communistic impact. You have to understand this. You have to recognize what is happening in the church. Ministers do not, I emphasize this, become communists. I cannot imagine a minister of Christ suddenly turning from his ministry for Christ to become a communist, for example. What actually takes place is that we have a socialization of our universities by infiltrators in the departments of sociology particularly and a takeover of those universities and of our divinity schools. I know what I'm talking about. I stand ready to document it at any time. I have seen it documented. I know this to be true. You know, a horse has blinders. When uh, the horseless carriage or the motor car first came out and someone back in the early days went out into the street with a motor car and other people were driving horses and buggies, why it became very, very necessary because anything that would distract the horse or cause him to balk could become very dangerous. And that's the problem that we're facing today. Many of our people are blind to issues simply because they have not actually been raised at the time they should have been raised, in one sense of the word. In other words, they say either we're born too late or born too soon. We see we have a window of consciousness that opens on the world. And that window is not able to take in a spectrum of history wide enough to be able to appraise all these things. And that is why it is important today that we understand the riddle of this age, that we understand the rider on the white horse. I'm going to show you that before we're through. In one sense of the word, in our time, we have seen nation after nation become either socialist or communist oriented. Is this true or false? Ask yourself the question and answer it for yourself. This, of course, has a very bad effect upon our world because if this nation, America, were to fall and become communistic, it would fulfill the scriptures that clearly refer to the red dragon. I'll try to quote this for you. It goes like this, and it's speaking of the emerging Christ consciousness, it's speaking of the divine man-child. It says, and to the woman, now this is not to just the woman Mary, but it's to the cosmic woman Mary, to the cosmic mother, to the divine mother of the world, to the composite spiritual genius of spiritual womanhood, the ability to bring forth the Christ consciousness, it says, and to the woman were given the wings of an eagle that she should fly into the wilderness where there is a place prepared for her. Now the wings of an eagle refer in this case to the uplift and also symbolically to our own country. Saint Germain actually appeared to George Washington and poured an ampule of holy oil over his head and anointed him in Johann Kelpius' cave 
in Fairmount Park in the city of Philadelphia in our own land. And the Ascended Masters had a great deal to do with the development of this nation, this wilderness land that from coast to coast was dedicated to nothing more than a happy hunting ground for the American Indian. I'm not condemning the Indians. They're all happy people. They're all God's children. But the point is, they were not taking the fullest advantage of this land. And seeing the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof, the coming of the founding fathers, the coming of the pilgrims to this land was an intentional one. And we have seen a great deal of history occur upon this continent. No, I'm not standing up just for America alone. I stand for the whole world. I stand for all humanity. And we as Americans have probably been most generous in our sharing of our wealth with many underprivileged people in this world. But more than just the physical wealth that goes in our pocket is the spiritual wealth that we should actually share with other nations. And all nations should be one in a spiritual sense, but not in a Babylonian one. Nimrod builded the Tower of Babel, and he tried to gather all nations together as one nation. But there was danger in that too because we find that as in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah it is so easy to pull men and women downhill but so difficult to raise them up. It's very easy through association. If everybody's doing it, whatever they're doing, it's very easy for people to say, well, everybody's doing it so I'll do it. And probably that's the way they're spreading hot pants. <laughs> if you get the idea. But you have to understand that by a like token, it should be just as easy to raise people up, but it isn't. It isn't as easy. Because the momentums that people have that are in the Akashic records of themselves, the habit patterns that people have formed, the habits of negative thinking, the habits of darkness, the habits of centuries of time are deeply ingrained in the subconscious and the psyche and being of man. Therefore, man needs the liberation of the Spirit of Christ in order to erase the records that are otherwise disturbing and creating a constant disturbance in his world. This uh, manifests as unhappiness. Do you understand? Now we come to the crossroads. This is what I want to take. It's very important. The rider on the white horse represents the victorious Christ consciousness which happens to belong to you and me. Jesus was not interested in sitting on a throne. He clearly demonstrated that. He didn't want the, the crown of this world. You remember on Palm Sunday where they tried to crown him king of kings and lord of lords? He didn't want it. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. He did not mean that his kingdom was impractical. He did not mean that his kingdom could not be appropriated by man for his use here. He meant that he, as the figurehead of Jesus Christ, did not want to have attached to him some glory and honor that would say, we love you, Jesus, because you're the only begotten Son of God. What he wanted to convey to the world was their own oneness with God their own ability to drink into the kingdom of heaven. This was the whole idea. Nothing made Jesus happier than to grab the little children and put the little children on his knee. He, he was happy to dangle them on his knee. He said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. For if such is the kingdom of heaven, Jesus loved people of all ages. And what he wanted to do was to develop in those people an awareness of childlike simplicity, not the sophistication that we can easily obtain from textbooks, not the mere banding of large words, which we can always learn, not something to make people think how smart we are, but to make people realize how really close to God they are. I heard Mahalia Jackson singing, His Eye is on the Sparrow. And of course, as she sang this song, I could feel 
the tremendous beauty and radiance in the idea, in just the thought, his eye is on the sparrow. Well, if his eye is on the sparrow, he must be taking a look at me too. And just that idea conveyed in a simplistic way the fact that God loves people. God loves us. So many people do not realize that God loves them. They consider God as very hard, like the man in the parable of the talents. You're a hard man. You reap where you don't sow. You're the Lord of the universe. You've got everything. I don't have anything. You know, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Well, that's not the idea. Because every man and every woman in history from a spiritual standpoint, and I'm talking about a lot of people who are not even written down in textbooks, just ordinary people, just folks. They have made their way in the eyes of God to the very altars of heaven. And who knows but what one of them will indeed sit down with me, quote, upon my throne. So we should try to disabuse our mind of this idea of human greatness as popularity as someone saying, oh, I love that person, I love this person, because they're great. Love people because God is in them, not for what they can do for you, but for the fact that you can do something for them. And if you contribute a spark to each person, and they contribute a spark to you, it's like a little jigsaw puzzle. You can put the pieces together, and the first thing you know, an emerging face of Christ comes out of it all. And you see in this composite whole the manifestation of reality. Why God made everyone. Alphabets, little parts of God. We put them all together and we have the face of reality in part. And how wonderful it is. So you see, what has happened in our time now is that we have lost this sweet simplicity of the realization of the fact that God loves us, his eye is on the sparrow. We don't think of that anymore, no. We want to become metaphysical. We want to become occult. We want to be mysterious. We want to sit in a seance. We want to invoke the spirits of the dead. Why, well, we've got the living God within us. And I'm sure that all who have passed on, who are worth contacting and worth knowing, are certainly with that God. And if we contact God or Christ or the Christ reality of ourselves, why they come to life to vivification within our consciousness. And so in reality we are more consciousness than we are physical. Do you see the point? No. The white horse today has become the white elephant. Not in reality, but in the world of illusion. Today, people are getting off the ship of religion because the white elephant they don't want. The rider on the white horse, they do. And who is the rider on the white horse? It's the Christ consciousness. This beautiful manifestation of tangible reality that always was and what does it say in the ancient scriptures? It says, in the beginning was God, and then it says, and by him, that is by Christ, all things were made, and without him was nothing made that was made. There is a return to faith, however, on the part of many people today. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to apply the label to all society and say, oh, they're all turning away from God. They are turning away from this crutch of organized religion. They're turning away from this crutch that has become a decaying substance that today has created a stench in their nostril that they cannot stand because it is hypocritical and because it does not hold to the faith in the living God, nor does it hold to the manifestation that Christ manifested when he was here on earth. I do not blame people for this, but I understand that the work was the work of the father of lies. I understand that the powers of the princes of the air, of the rulers of spiritual wickedness in high places have planned and plotted this, and yet I also understand that man has invited it. People have invited 
this deterioration by their apathy, by their ignorance, and by their failure to convey the truth of the living God to succeeding generations. They have not passed the torch. Today, then, we have a deterioration of values in the world. Dare anyone in this audience tell me who has lived any length of time that we are not today affected by a deterioration of values. Some people may say, well, we have a change of values. I say we have. I agree with you. But this change is not for the better. It is a change for the worse because we are taking away from people the symbol and we are giving them nothing. Of course, in one sense of the word, the symbol is hypocritical. So we really have to ask ourselves this honest question. What have we taken away from the people? What really have we taken away? Well, we didn't do it. But I mean, what has been taken away from the people? So now, we come to the point where I want to bring forth to you the idea that the purpose of life is not really known by man. Individuals today are not taught why they are here. And the answer to why we are here cannot be given just in this lecture or in perhaps half of the lectures. A certain portion of that will be conveyed in the total conference. But to give you everything, to just boil it down in a nutshell, in one simple word and say, well, this is why we are here. It's not so easy to do because the understanding of people has not evolved to the point where as a rule the masses can understand what it means. It's not just that simple. His eye is on the sparrow, he's looking at you. People say, yes, God is concerned about me. And it is true, he is. But are you concerned about him? That is the question. Or are you more concerned about yourself, your finite life, than you are about the purposes that God himself in the beginning envisioned for you? Well, how can a man be concerned in the purposes of God's vision if he does not know what God's vision is? So I think in the simplistic consciousness, there is to be found a certain value as long as it's honest with itself because gradually we are building up the pieces of the puzzle and fitting them together until we will see Christ be formed in us, as St. Paul said a long, long time ago. He spoke to the men of Athens, and he said, As I was passing by Mars Hill, I beheld an altar with the inscription upon it, To the unknown God, whom ye ignorantly worship." Him declare I unto you. And this is what we have to understand, that the declaration of the principle of God, the vision of the rider on the white horse, the vision of the emerging Christ consciousness must be restored to the remnant that are now upon the earth, which remnant must be increased until the sea becomes a wave of the golden age. I want you to understand there is a need for teachers. There is a need in the world today for those who can convey to humanity some glimpse of the vision of the reality of man. What man really is. What his life is for. When he really understands it, he's much happier. But if he doesn't understand it, what is he going to do? He's going to seek, like most of the world does, for sense happiness. And how does sense happiness work in fulfilling the drama of the soul. It doesn't work at all. What it does, it acts as a palliative to our mind. Momentarily, we'll say we're hungry. And so we eat a meal. We're full. So we eat another meal. And we're full. And so it goes. This is the bottomless pit of man's continuing desire. It will never end because as soon as he is satisfied, his desires, right away another desire pops up. Have you ever thought about your physical needs of eating and drinking? 
from the standpoint of the kingdom of heaven. You know, the Bible was very much concerned about it. In the Bible it spoke of man's God being his belly, whose glory is in his shame, whose consciousness was turned to outer things. I believe this to be 100% true. And so I was quite interested to find out that the masters, and especially the master Saint Germain, I'm thinking particularly of him, came down here to this world and as an ascended being moved among the court of France and did not need to eat a thing. Isn't that interesting? He didn't have to eat a thing. And do you know what happened at one time when he was actually seated with a group of officials? They asked him to demonstrate his power. And so he demonstrated it. There was a large window in the building they were seated in. And they opened these windows up. And several men were seated there at a table. And he waved his hand and the table just floated right out through the window with the people on chairs. <laughs> and it came right back in again later on and no one was hurt. But this was a similar thing to the miracles of Jesus. Once the event has taken place, it's very easy for people to convince themselves that they didn't really see it. It didn't really happen. It was an illusion. You see, and this would be true in this room here. I remember when I was a boy, one time I went to see Marquis the Magician. And I guess I was fascinated because his name was similar to my own. And he had a tent at one end of the stage and another tent at the other end of the stage. And he had a horse going to one tent. And he had a girl going to the other tent, and he showed that both tents were empty beforehand, and then he shot a gun. And instantly they opened the tents up, and the horse came out of the opposite tent, and the girl came out of the opposite tent. <laughs> and I knew the stage because it didn't have any trap doors on it. So I said to myself, how can this be? And that originally prompted me to some degree to take up the study of magic. <laughs> so you all have to understand that illusions that are hardly dreamed of actually are done today and have been done for centuries by men. But putting somebody out into the air the way Saint Germain did was not an illusion and couldn't be done. So you see, the whole answer to the riddle of this age lies in our understanding the purpose of life and then returning to the remnant of the original followers of Christ. So while we here, as a part of the outer branch of the Great White Brotherhood, are probably, by comparison to the people in the world, a small number, we should understand that our role, like the role of the early twelve disciples, is significant in answering the calls that are now coming as pleas from people all over this nation and all over this world. People want to know what is the answer to the deterioration of the churches. They want to know what is the answer to true religion. They want to know what is the answer to the riddle of their lives. They want to come in contact with a man on the white horse. And that's not John Wayne even though he was over at Pagosa Springs and we went through there. They want the living Christ and they want the reality of it and they want that reality in their own lives. Now I want to tell you from my own experience that I know that the world does not have to know what is going on inside of you in the kingdom of heaven in order for it to be happening. For example, in one dictation several years ago in Washington, D.C., I was actually levitated about an inch above the floor level. And because I was standing behind the podium, nobody knew it. They just thought I'd grown a little taller. No, I'm not levitating right now. <laughs> and so the audience, they were looking, and this actually took place, that 
as the dictation was going forth into the audience. Bands of light like the rings on trees began building around my physical body until like the creation of a phony cataract, this being a very thin membrane around me, the audience gradually faded from view until I felt like Peter and John on the mountaintop with Jesus and I could not hardly see the people. And all of this light was pouring out into the audience. And then I trotted down through the aisle afterward to the very normal world of shaking hands with the people. And somehow or other I had the crazy idea that these people must have seen that light, and some did. But the point I'm trying to make is that spiritual light vibrates at a different rate than can be discerned by the physical eyes of man. That doesn't mean it's any less real. It simply is not discerned by all. And I came down and I knew I'd had a very supernormal experience. I knew this was not ordinary. I don't ordinarily float an inch above the ground. I don't ordinarily have light between me so I cannot see people. As a rule, my vision is fairly fair. You know exactly what I mean. And I knew something had taken place, and it did. So I got down there, and a lady came up to me and said to my wife, my wife's standing there, and she said, Elizabeth, I just love you. You're a wonderful person. She came up to me and she said, I wish I could say the same for you. And so, right then and there, I realized that if she had seen the light and seen what was taking place, she wouldn't have said that. Not that that would make me any better because the light moved through me, but at least she would know that I was devoted to the purpose of trying to help people. And there was something that was manifesting of the divine nature. So the point I want to make in this lecture this afternoon and finalize it for you is that the rider on the white horse has come to all ages from the birth of Christ. He came in Jesus. He came in St. Paul later in time. He manifested in St. Francis. He manifested in, in many of the holy men of the early church. But somewhere along the line, the golden thread was broken and men faked it. They turned around and they took the trappings, the trappings of doctrine, and they passed it on to people, but they never conveyed the real image of the rider on the white horse, the real image of the living Christ. And there was a lot of skullduggery and hanky-panky, call it what you want to, that went on in the Middle Ages and throughout Christendom. And now that we have inherited this, we have not inherited as a race, as a nation, as a people. We have not inherited the purity of the teachings of Jesus Christ. But it has been preserved in the Akashic records. We'll draw it forth and we'll show it to you. We won't do it in this lecture, but we will show it to you through the conference. I remember a conversation I had with Jesus many years ago. And I've told it to the group before, but there are people here that have not heard it. He said to me, you have heard it written, no man can see God and live. I said, yes. And he said, it is not so recorded in the Akashic Records. It is, no man can see God and live as man. And he gave me those words, and they clearly showed how the truth can be distorted by the omission of just a couple of words from the Bible. And if you don't believe it, look at how many versions there are besides the King James Version. There are many versions of the Scriptures, the Moffat Translation, Maybe there'll even be a prophet translation someday, I don't know. (laughs) But there's a lot of translations. And the point is that the answer is not 
to be found in the letter that killeth, but in the spirit that giveth life. And the life is to be found in the relationship that man has with God, not with some pseudo idea of a human being. So if you want to contact the rider on the white horse, if you want to let the divine man-child rule your life with a rod of iron, then understand that the human ego cannot rule your life. Instead of the human ego ruling your life, the Christ identity of yourself must take control and command of your being. And I don't care if they shake the planet like a rat terrier shakes a rat. I don't care what happens to anything in this world. If you have a complete union with your Holy Christ self, it wouldn't affect you in the least. Because you are not that body. You are not even that mind that says, how am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? With God, all things are possible. And you have to realize that. You have to realize the history of the times in which you live. You have to realize that today we are the products of our environment and the products of our heredity both. We are not just the products of our environment and our environment is a changing environment. So what we should and ought to be concerned with is to become the divine remnant. It says that a remnant shall be saved. We should be concerned to become the divine remnant that will become the remnant of the decaying age we live in and the seed starter of the age to come, which is the golden age of peace and power and tranquility, when the world will beat their swords into pruning hooks. You know what I'm talking about. We have to do this, we have to change the state of the world, but we cannot blindly say we will abolish our army and our navy and our marine corps and destroy our police force and do everything because we still have today in the world enemies of democracy and of freedom. We have those who would bring us into a deeper slavery than we have ever dreamed of. And what I am concerned with is that we have tenure, that we have time, that we have a space and an opportunity to do these things which can be done. Our world can live in the greatest age of all past society. This can be a wonderful time we live in if we will only make it so. And the opportunity to do it lies as a gift in our hands. May all of us begin to reassess and re-examine our future and the future of our nation not in the light of some lopsided idea, but with an openness of heart, of mind, and of being that is willing to weigh and consider, to listen and to learn. Because then and only then, as we become as little children, pliable in the eyes of God, not wedded to some sort of a doctrine that is purely the doctrines of men, but wedded to the spirit of the invincible God that brings to us a victorious Christ consciousness which is ours to behold, ours to live in. Thank you.